Good evening and welcome to Mary's Mantle Consecration. Today we're praying for Alicia Clark and Valerie Dubois. We'll begin with our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Most Holy Mother, whom I love tenderly as my own, in your sacred presence I offer to you these days of preparation for consecration in honor of the stars that adorned your heavenly mantle. I appeal to you to intercede these 46 days for all of my needs, for those of my loved ones, and for your special intentions. Please show me the sweet compassion that you showered upon St. Juan Diego, your messenger. Please give me a pure and virtuous heart like your own so that I might derive the same consolation, the soothing of my pains, and the lifting of my soul that Juan Diego received from the gentle words that you gave to him centuries ago. Listen, put it into your heart, my dearest one, that the thing that disturbs you, the thing that afflicts you, is nothing. Do not let your countenance, your heart, be disturbed. Do not fear any sickness nor anything that is sharp or hurtful. Am I not here, I who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Do you need anything more? <clears throat> Okay, so this evening we are on star 24 and we are looking at friendliness. It is so easy to be friendly. Actions and attitudes that express affection, a smile, a gesture, a look, a pat on the back, a question, how are you? Change the course of history. To make someone happy, can take but a second. How life-giving, even stupendous it can be to approach a person in distress and say, don't be afraid, my friend. All this will pass. Count on me. While no blueprint exists for friendliness, what is important, based on the way we treat others, is that the person perceives that I am with him or I value him. We can spend a good deal of our time and attention looking to others to see who might fulfill us, searching for a friendly word or break from the monotony of the day, monotony, <laughs> checking voicemails, emails, texts. How selfless and gracious is the person who spends as much or more time in such activities, doling out messages of consolation as much or more time in such, I'm oh, sorry, I got, I'm sorry, messages of consolation, hope, and goodwill. All it takes is a turning away from self to the other. Simply being happy is a turning away from self to others. Simply being happy, even without the intention of spreading cheer, breeds joy. In this study, that follows the happiness of nearly 5,000 individuals over 20 years, researchers discovered that when an individual becomes cheerful, the network effect can be measured up to three degrees, like the extending ripples from the stone tossed in a pond. One person's happiness triggers a chain reaction that benefits not only his friends, but their friends, friends, and so on, the trickling effect lasting for up to one year. When we become joyful, our next door neighbors have a 34% chance or higher chance of becoming happy themselves. 
A spouse experiences an 8% increased chance of greater joy. And for a friend living close by, it's 25%. The possibilities go on. A friend of that friend has a nearly 10% chance of an increase of happiness, and a friend that's a friend has a 5.6% increased chance of it. So, within the benevolent dictates of divine providence, joy has greater power than sadness. Interestingly, unhappiness does not spread through social networks as robustly as happiness. Joy, it seems, loves company more than misery. Even reaching out to strangers who are two or three degrees removed, and the effect is hardly fleeting. What a sublime task it is to wrap others in a mantle of joy. What a beautiful profession it is to hand out small portions of hope. Even if we may not be basking in happiness ourselves, it is so easy to lift up others through a friendly compliment. Everyone loves what you've done. I've heard great things about you. What a wonderful talent you have. You're a blessing. Friendliness is sensitive current, warm and deep that travels the world. I love these um, explanations on friendliness from Christina and um, I, I did, couldn't help but think about like the scientific study of friendliness because there was one time when um, I was teaching in um, one of our schools and the principal had us have a, um, a teacher's meeting and she had gone to a workshop and so she was trying the workshop out on us. And so she had two teachers who had to um, concentrate on a image that was in front of them and when they were finished the funny thing is now I can't remember what it was they did um, there was something like they had to push something as, as hard as they could okay and I'm not quite sure that's that's terrible because that was the part that was important but anyway <laughs> be that as it may I just remember that the person who had the smiley face had so much more strength than the person who had the sad face. And they didn't know that at all. It was really interesting to watch, okay? That, um, and they would do that with a couple people, okay? And it, it was very consistent that the person who had to study the sad face uh, compared to the person who had to study the happy face. And they said, because just a smile ends up releasing in the body what's called endorphins. And so it gives the body more strength. Um, Okay, so, sorry about that. My example wasn't very good on that one, but it was an interesting study. And, um, and you know, I have found that I tell people, especially when we suffer with a, a little bit of depression, that putting an actual physical smile on your face actually is helpful, okay, to fighting a depression. Maybe you look a little bit loony, but okay. You know what? Um, we're made of a body and soul. Okay, and our physical body and actually, you know, it is in a relaxed position when it's smiling, okay, and it allows the body, okay, to actually release some of that tension and can allow our spirit to be lifted somewhat. So, but a smile from another person does that as well. So friendliness is it's pleasant, it makes you approachable, it makes you mindful of another's presence. So when I was thinking about friendliness, um, a plethora of stories came to mind. But my first example is actually going to be unfriendliness. And I think about the story which I believe Bishop Sheen mentioned um, in some of his talks. But it was about, and I believe it was Mussolini, but I'm terrible with names, but I know it was one of the leaders of the nation's either Italy, I, don't, I know it wasn't Hitler uh, in this one. So anyway, but it, it could have been even a Russian leader. But all I remember is that they were all, an altar boy. And they were in the cathedral, and they were bringing um, up the cruets, and they dropped one. And it made a loud crash. I don't know if it actually broke, but at least it spilled. And unfortunately, the priest 
behaved very poorly in his lack of patience and kindness. And it actually drove that person from the church, from religion, from God. Now, it shouldn't, okay? All right, because you know what? We all lose our temper, okay? So just because a priest loses their temper, it's not a good reason. But it was the triggering reason for this person. Okay, and again, I think of another story. And this is a young boy, and I don't know if he was canonized. I know he was beatified. His name is Jose Sanchez de Rio. He's a little boy who died at the age of 14 as a martyr in Mexico. But when he was younger, at least in the movie, I didn't read his story, so I'm going to base that they had this part correct. But anyway, he was hanging around with other boys who were not a good influence on him. And they ended up getting themselves in trouble. I can't remember if they were throwing stones and broke a window of the church, but they did something that, that was not good. And so the priest approached their parents, and um, Jose's parents had him go to the church and do a certain amount of hours of work for the priest. So whether it was sweeping the floors or the benches or whatever particular job. Now this priest, he understood. He was a boy. We all do crazy things. And he was very kind to him. He did not belittle him. He treated him as if he was doing an act of charity almost. And, um, and I don't know if he had to do this for like maybe a week. But at one point, this priest saw the goodness of this boy. And he wanted him to rise up, to have a, a sense of dignity. So on purpose, he dropped his wallet under um, the kneeler where he had been praying. And he knew that Jose was going to be having to clean and dust things, and it would, he would find it. But he had left the church, he went into the sacristy, and he just let it all play out. And even if he took it, he, he would let him take it. But he knew that he, he just had this belief so much in Jose. And Jose debated when he found the wallet. And he thought about the goodness of the priest to him, the kindness of this priest, despite the fact that he had done badly. And so he owns up to the wallet and gives it to the priest, who, after this, they become such good friends. And, and this boy is so edified by this priest that it completely steers his life in the right direction. And anyway, and eventually he lays down his life um, in the Mexican uh, um, Civil War, um, you know, and his, his, his words were, you know, long live Christ the King. By the way, that's our crown <laughs> for Christ the King. Um, we um, have that this Sunday and, um, you know, just being able to have him be the Lord of our life, the King of our heart. So that's just a little crown, <laughs> just a little one, okay, that we have here uh, set up for that particular feast day. Okay, but another thing that hit me, okay, was an officer Fritz. He belonged to the Nazis, and he was over the concentration camp in um, Poland. And at the end of the war, he was imprisoned, and he was found guilty of so many crimes. I mean, just the entire mistreatment, abuse, killing of, of so many souls, especially the Polish who were in um, those camps. And while he was awaiting his execution, the people who were guarding him were so kind. And even people in the area, they knew that you know they were dependent on food from others and they would bring it. And he found their hearts to be so forgiving. And he was so guilty. And, and, he, and it was weighing so heavily on him. And yet he was treated with such kindness and such dignity 
that it actually brought about his complete conversion, and he was able to receive all the sacraments and go to the execution uh, with great peace. But it was due to the kindness of others, despite the horrendous crimes that he was guilty of. There was also another um, Nazi leader, Officer Kepler, I think that was his name, um, and then it was Monsignor O'Flaherty in Rome. And um, Kepler even killed O'Flaherty's best friend, a priest, uh, one of his good friends, and many others. And O'Flaherty was amazing, okay, because he was able to save thousands, okay, of Jewish people and even American soldiers, okay, all kinds of people who were trying to escape the Nazis if they ended up being in Rome. And he was able to hide them in all kinds of places, came up with all kinds of disguises to be able to get from one place to another. Um, and I mean, the officer um, or Colonel uh, Kepler, he just wanted so badly to kill this uh, Monsignor O'Flaherty, but never managed it, okay? Um, and when the war ended and he was um, going to um, be found out and, and put in jail and all this, he begged O'Flaherty to see him and begged him to save his wife and child. And O'Flaherty's like, you? Who, had, who tore apart families, who threw people into concentration camps, who murdered my friends, and you would dare to even ask this? And Kepler's like, so everything you said about the Catholic faith, it's false, isn't it? None of it's true. It's just only for those who are in your um, ballpark and all this. Well, Lo and behold, Kepler didn't know it until maybe a couple years later. His wife and his son disappeared. No one ever found them so that they could not also be prosecuted. And then he realized that Flaherty had even saved his wife and his son despite all the people personally who were brutalized by this man. Also, O'Flaherty, okay, was the only person who went to visit this man and actually brought about his conversion. Okay, so this friendliness, it can be extreme. Okay, when we see these examples. But there was a little girl who died. Well, she wasn't a little girl, I guess. She was a young lady. Um, her name was Teresita, and she was a lover of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. She died when she was either 19 or 21. But she was so enamored by Therese because Therese had the art of friendliness. And so when she started a group, or headed a group, I should say, she didn't start it, but it's a group of a sodality, a group that was devoted to Mary, she wanted to model her group on following the apostleship of, of the smile, okay? Um, and that's what she would call it, okay? Because when she looked at St. Therese and she looked at Our Lady, she thought, what quality do I want the girls to be able to emulate? And it was this amiability, this friendliness. So she had down 10 rules on how to actually practice it. So hers are to smile until a kindly smile forms readily on one's lips. Now this is really beautiful because again, when you see someone who looks grumpy, it automatically puts you on edge or makes you feel unwelcome. But a smile, oh my goodness, it is just so welcoming. To repress a sign of impatience at a very start, okay? And again, catching that is really important because, you know, no one likes to be feeling like they're an inconvenience. And so that little look of impatience is enough sometimes to set people off. To add a word of benevolence when giving orders. Okay, and you know, I, I think about um, how s you can be so uh, cut and dry in the way in which you say something, or how, you know, just um, like make a person part of a team, part of a family, in the way in which you give orders. 
and respecting their dignity, even, you know, making sure that there wasn't something else there, even as you're giving orders, or at least listening to something that maybe they need to share that you were unaware of instead of having all the answers. So that adding a word of benevolence is so beautiful. And again, it shows us friendliness and it allows, okay, again, for um, a, a great way of building another person up by respecting and, and giving them that sense of um, camaraderie. To reply positively when asked to do a favor. Okay, and again, this is... Um, something that we learn to practice self-denial. One of the things that I've learned in life is that you can make plans for a day, and we should. You know, this is a way of putting order and mission, uh, you know, in place. But typically, that's like the setting. The most important moments of your day are typically the interruptions. Those are where Jesus comes in. You know, and, and how do we behave on those? You know, at the end of the day, it's not the paperwork that we did. It's not the clean floor that we managed to get done. Um, but it's how did I react to my child when they had a question about some assignment or they forgot that they need to go to such and such a place, um, you know, or the phone rings. Um, or if someone at work, you know, has a problem with their computer and you go over to help them. The, the everyday situations that we find ourselves in, those are really like the God moments for us, where that friendliness needs to be practiced again and again. And it, it, it takes self-denial, but if we can make ourselves positive so that a person realizes that they can come to us, you know, that we're approachable, to lend a helping hand to the unfortunate, you know, keeping an eye out for those, you know, who are around us and being able to see their needs. Again, something that truly edifies me and so many other people that I know when I, I'm so oblivious and I just feel always ashamed of compared <laughs> to other people, but I'm really grateful for them and, um, you know, and I try to try to follow their lead, but it's something that we can always work on is keeping an eye out for anyone that we see, just struggling. Um, or do, again, just maybe they just need a, a, a word of kindness, a word of interest. To please those towards whom one feels a repugnance. Okay? And again, we don't want to follow just our feelings. Don't worry about whether we have a repugnance. So, you know, like St. Therese, I, I mean, I really have I've always been so edified that she would give her sweetest smile to the sister that natural inclination would, <laughs> would draw her actually to walk a mile out of her way not to meet her. And yet she would give her her sweetest. Okay, so this idea of, you know, being pleasing, pleasing those towards whom one feels repugnance. Okay, another a directive from Teresita is to study and satisfy the tastes of another um, with whom one lives. And this is something, you know, just paying attention to the things that they typically like without even having to ask. And, you know, or noticing that, you know, they always move that chair whenever they come into the room, if it's in a certain position. And, and maybe moving it before they come in. Or, you know, a particular way in which they like something laid out. So just paying attention, just, you know, for those fine little touches. These are beautiful ways of um, finessing our friendliness, okay? Um, to avoid complaining. And, you know, again, that's, that's a hard one, but it's, it's such a powerful one. You know, um, because if a person's always complaining... The likelihood is the moment you walk out of the room, they're complaining about you too. <laughs> so it doesn't really breed friendliness. Okay, to respect everyone. And this is something, again, um, it, it, it works almost with that avoiding complaining. If we can put a good word in for other people, if we don't have something good to say, then don't say anything. You know, that, that's respect. You know, because... I remember giving, I was making Station of the Cross one time, and I don't even know where I read it, but it, was, it might have been in this little book that I, one of my favorite ones was Station of the Cross. But 
All I know is when I came to the 13th station, the person who wrote the reflection mentioned that after Jesus died, I mean, one of the greatest horrors is to see that he wasn't dead enough and that they would actually go ahead and, and gash his side open, you know, with a, you know, and, and he, they said, like, when a person is out of a room, it's like, in one sense, there's no way for them to defend themselves. It's sort of like that dead, our, our, our Lord being dead on the cross. And if we go about bashing that person, you know, it, it's sort of like that desecration of our Lord's body. Because our Lord says, whatever you do to the least of my brother, you do to me. So if our words are not words that we would want that person to hear if they were present, then we need with all our heart to avoid saying them at all. All right, and the last one that she had written down was to correct if one must, but with kindness. So these are the dispositions which... Um, we find in the most amiable virgin and we place them in our hearts. So that is from our little Teresita. Okay, Quinta Vela, I think. Anyway, I don't know if she's blessed yet, but her life story is beautiful. She was going to become a professional... Well, ready? <laughs> Memory. Either basketball player or tennis. I don't remember which one. But um, in the end, she gave up that whole uh, endeavor because she felt the call of God and she entered into um, the comet. But unfortunately, I think she got tuberculosis very early on. And, um, but all the while, as a sister, she was a role model as she had been during her high school years. Okay, another thing that I had wanted to bring up. Oh, Friendliness, okay, was another example. And this is a true story. Again, I just, I, I just wish I could remember names, okay, because um, <laughs> this is a story about a couple who ended up knocking at the door of a very small um, hotel. And they hadn't booked for a room because they really weren't planning on staying there. But because of either car problems or something, they needed a place to stay. So when they knocked on the door, the person who owned the hotel opened it, and all the rooms were full. I mean, he was just a little guy. I mean, there weren't that many rooms. And he's looking at these, this young, I don't know if they were a young couple, or maybe I think they were actually an older couple. And he's like, well, come on in. I mean, it was raining out there. and. Um, they, they, are, they are apologizing for not having um, made reservations, but he was apologizing for not having a room. And he said, no, 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 I do have a room, um, if you don't mind. And he's like, I, you can have my room, you know, because I, I don't need my whole, I mean, just, it's, it's, a, it's a double bed, you know what I mean? So you, you both could be there. He said, I can be out in this other room out here. I've got to man the desk anyway. And, um, and the couple were so moved by how kind and considerate and, and you know, how, much he, how well he took care of them, only to find out in the morning that they were actually the owners of one of the most expensive hotels in New York. And the man said, I've been looking for someone to take over this hotel. And I want to ask you if you would, because you're my ideal of what a manager would be. And so he became the manager, and again, that's where my, my lack of memory for the name of the hotel um, is. But uh, that was based on a true story. Also, there was, I have so many stories, so I just want to share them all. Okay, Le Miserable. Okay, um, in that story, there is a man who is an ex-prisoner, and when he comes out, he is treated very kindly by a bishop who lets him have a, a wonderful meal at his home, a room to stay at. But in the morning, the prisoner is gone. And so is, I don't know if it was the china or some particular item that was very expensive. And he's traveling and 
He is found by the police, and the police are very suspicious when they see some expensive thing that this prisoner, ex-prisoner had, and they recognize that where he had been, and they take him back to the bishop's house and say, look, we found what, this um, item with him. And the bishop looks at the man and says, I can't believe you forgot to take the silverware as well, as if he had given it to him as a gift. And he gave him the silverware as well and told the police, no, these are all for him. I gave them to him. And so this man was given this beautiful second chance in life. And although at first he wasn't completely able to grasp it, you know, eventually that kindness of that bishop ended up changing his whole path and the path of others. So, um, you know, that, that idea of kindness is something that's really, really powerful. I witnessed kindness in a priest named Father Thomas Dubé. He would talk about it. Um, I remember one time he said he was um, on some campus and he would walk along and no one ever looked up. No one ever greeted anybody. They would just be walking along. So he purposely made sure, because they were either looking at their phone or doing whatever, he would make sure he greeted people. And people would be like stunned out of their thing, like, oh, Oh, hi, you know what I mean, and go on. Well, he would do this so consistently that it ended up that many people automatically then started greeting, okay, where there was no greeting going on. But as I said, I got to witness this because um, I was in the summer school, <laughs> and he was one of the teachers that I didn't get to have, but he was the priest for us during the summer. And he, um, his sermons were so beautiful. And we had had him also for retreat at our convent, and he had talked about uh, genuine gospel kindness and friendliness. And so we had ended Mass, and we had to be in a, they were redoing the chapel, so we were actually in one of the classrooms that sort of transformed into a chapel. And as we were leaving, we were all going down the hallway, and we'd all go over to eat at that time. But there was one young woman, and she was just, like, she was, well, she was way depressed, okay? But then it was the point where you couldn't even, like, you know, you would try to stand with her and, and engage her in a conversation, and, you know, you might get a muffled yes or no, and she wouldn't cooperate with walking with you, you know, and you were trying, so you sort of gave up. But he didn't. He walked with her, and he held the door until she came through. And it was so genuine, and it was so beautiful. Then another time, we were um, had come over to the cafeteria, and I happened to be at his table, I think, that day, along with another sister. And we had gotten engaged in some crazy conversation, okay, whatever it was. But um, someone else came along and said, oh, can we join your table? And he's like, oh, sure. So these two people came in, and he said, oh, you know what, we were talking about such and such and such and such, and, he had said, and then we just continued the conversation. Well, along came another person. Our table ended up being interrupted about five or six times, but every time, he would just say, oh, you know, like, welcome them by name, or if he didn't know their name, sort of like, join them in, always catch them up to where we were, but he did it so naturally. It was the most, it was so edifying. It was truly something that I've never forgotten in that idea that every single person mattered. And just because they came late, he didn't let them be left out. It was, he just got them all up to um, the time period that we're at, the subject that we were on, and very, very mindful of others. So that friendliness. The last one on friendliness that I want to mention is about a story about a nurse. This came from Father Levasic. The only thing is I might, have, I might have mixed two stories together, but Freddie, I'm just going to tell the story as I remember it, and I might have two stories mixed up. But you know what? They're both, both true, so if they're mixed up, this is, <laughs> the, the message is the same. So um, anyway, so there, well, before we start with the nurse, let's start with this man. And there was this man. He was in charge of the tracks. For whatever reason, I always have it as Colorado, so let's just call it Denver, Colorado. 
probably should be Idaho. But anyway, let's just say it was Denver. So anyway, he was in charge of the tracks. He would have to switch them over the trolleys and this kind of thing um, in the town. And unfortunately, he had a drinking problem. And when the, he, when the trolley or the train was coming through the town, he had forgotten to move the track Okay, so that it was going you know, in one direction rather than another direction. And because of that, the train ended up going into a vehicle and killing a man and his son. This man was so distraught that he just sort of disappeared from the scene. And he went up a mountain and people never even knew who he was, what his story was. He would just come in town every once in a while, look very gruff and and unkept. And at some point or another, he ended up getting sick and was taken to a hospital. But he was, he was nasty. He he was just, um, just became such an angry person and um, just had no good words to say, and the nurses just wanted to get out of his room. But this one nurse, she just was always kind and always smiling at him. And he, he couldn't, you know, like, she was really winning him over. <laughs> and, he, and so one time he just sort of, you know, spilled everything out about what was weighing on him so heavily. And, and she was kind to him about it. But days went by, and he was still there, and he said, I just don't think I could ever be forgiven. She goes, no, I'm, I'm sure that you can be. And he said, how do you know? How would you know that I could be forgiven? You know what I mean? I took this father's life and his son. And she said, because on such and such a date in the town of Denver, I lost my father and my brother. And this was her. This was the man who had caused the death of her father and her, her brother. And she could forgive him. And she could be friendly to him. And she could love him. And because of this, he was able to find hope and, and was able to die with great peace. This, this friendliness, okay, includes sacrifice. And so we ask um, our Lord to give us a heart like his, where people could approach him, sinners approached him, they would be welcome to a table. And like Zacchaeus, they were not willing to be unchanged, but willing to be converted because they were believed in and they were loved.